Good evening, everyone. My name is Irina. I'm very glad to see all of you today. Can you please put a plus in the chat box if you can hear me well? From Kiev region, from Suma, from you. That's great, guys. That's great. So thank you very much for joining us and hopefully you'll find this webinar useful <laughs> and informative. So once again, my name is Irina. Uh, I am a Celta and Delta qualified teacher of English. And today we'll be, we will be talking about reading. Reading, the power of reading and how to help students become better and competent readers. So a couple of household things before we start. Uh, first of all, as you can see, you're all muted just to avoid any background noise and you will not be using your mics today. Uh, you will be participating a lot uh, so you can write your answers in the chat box in Zoom. Also, after the webinar, you will receive the presentation and you will receive your certificate of attendance. And at the end of the session, uh, we will discuss a couple of questions um, that you might have. So here is an overview of what we'll be discussing today. So by the end of the webinar, we will have identified who a good reader is. We will have found out um, common reading skills and strategies. Uh, you will also try several practical activities that you can take into your classroom. And we will look at the principles, the key principles of preparing um, a reading lesson. So to get us started, let's find out how often you use texts uh, from students' books or authentic texts in your lesson. Can you please uh, write a number in the chat box depending on your answer? One is never, two seldom, often, usually, always. And what do you use them for? You can see very often, usually. Some of you use them always. So the purposes are grammar, vocab presentation for grammar, for vocabulary, okay, I can see reading skills, lots of vocabulary, yeah. Lovely, well, great to see that all of you uh, use text very often in your classroom and I can see for a variety of purposes for discussion as well for stories yes that's great okay so we there are many different purposes that we have in mind when we bring texts into the classroom one of them is language purposes some of you are mentioning now vocabulary and grammar but what we are interested in today is how we can use text to develop reading skills that is to say how we can help students become better readers but before we discuss any set of skills let's brainstorm what we read uh, in our daily life for example i read newspapers books on methodology um, websites and dictionaries can you please type in the chat box what you read instagram posts novels books comments news blogs social media yes that's what we do quite often telegram news something that's connected with teaching stories great so there is a variety of text types as you can see um, there are many things that we read nowadays we are basically surrounded by texts but do we read them in the same or in different ways. So let's say that um, I want to see if a newspaper article is interesting or not for me to read. Will I read it in detail or not? Scheme, yes, great. I will scheme through the article to see if I want to read it or not. Um, if I'd like to find out when my bus arrives, Will I read about all the buses that arrive at the station? Depends on what I'm looking for. Yes, yeah, some scanning. Only for my, so I will look for specific information. 
that's great. Thank you very much, guys, for the ideas. So what can we conclude here? We can conclude that an active reader, a skilled reader, is the one who first knows the purpose of reading, why he or she is reading a text. Second, can apply different strategies depending on that purpose. And he or she is someone who looks at reading as an interaction. What kind of interaction do you think I mean here? Reading as an interaction. What kind of interaction between whom? Reader and writer, questions, getting information, reader and reader, that's interesting, discussion with colleagues. You're right. Yes, you're right. Uh, what I mean here is the interaction between the writer and the reader. So we need to remind our students that reading is a cooperation between them, uh, readers, and a writer. So that there is a message that they need to understand. And this understanding comes from active involvement of the reader, active involvement of students. So there is this element of interaction and cooperation. Right. So we, before we discuss any specific skills in classroom activities, let us take a look at the analogy uh, that I really like and I find very illustrative. So the analogy was suggested by Kristin Nuttall, who says that um, a text can be approached at two different levels, an eagle's eye view and a scientist with a magnifying glass. So the first level is when we start by asking students to predict the information from the text, the content of the text, and they read through to check understanding. Is it a global view or a more detailed view? Global, yes, exactly. What about a scientist with a magnifying glass? What kind of approach? is meant here. Detailed, yes. So the scientist, on the other hand, illustrates the activities that are focused on letters, words, sentences, and paragraph levels. So we start from the bottom and we go up. So we can look, we will be looking at reading from this perspective. Top-down processing is the one that when we um, uh, draw on our experience, our previous knowledge, our background knowledge about the topic, about the world, um, our own experience. And it allow us to have sense, the sense of perspective of the overall structure and idea of the text. Whereas in bottom-up processing, the analysis starts at the minimum level, starting from recognizing words, letters, chunks, the whole sentences and paragraphs. So this is the framework that we'll be using now to analyze some classroom activities. But these two approaches, they're not separate from each other. What do you think these two arrows mean? Yes, they are connected. We could do both. Readers use both processes. Yes, exactly. So these two approaches, they complement each other. So if from the general perspective, you still do not understand the writer's message, you try to do that from the bottom up perspective. You look at vocabulary, you look at separate sentences. So the two way of processing, they always interact with each other. And now we will be looking at different skills that belong either to top-down or bottom-up processing. So, so far we have decided that a reader is, needs to know the purpose and apply different strategies to achieve a particular purpose. So we're going to be doing now different activities that will allow us to analyze what skills are necessary for our students to become skilled readers. 
Now, here is here are some pictures and a title from a newspaper article. Look at them and make your predictions about what happened in the story, um, how the dog helped his owner uh, found, find the siblings. So look at it and remember to type only keywords in the chat box with your predictions. It became popular. So his story probably became popular. There was a reunion. Oh, the smell of the bottle. That's interesting. So they found each other thanks to a dog. So the dog might have helped them. Any other ideas? A water bottle? Oh, the rat cap. Yeah, that's funny. His clothes. TV. They, they might have seen uh, the dog on TV. The dog belongs to two owners. So the smell, clothes, um, rubbish. I have different options here. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much for your predictions. Could you please now read the story? I think some of you have guessed it correctly. So those of you who mentioned TV, um, he's, what he was doing, the, the rubbish, the, the smell of the, the reunion. So all of those ideas were correct. So you've guessed it correctly. Why do you think we need to ask students to make predictions? So let's analyze this very short activity. What was the purpose? To give reason, they get involved to engage pre-reading for critical thinking, to make them interested, some part of engagement, to be attentive. So both speaking and thinking. Great. Anticipate potential vocab. All right. So let's have a look at the analysis. So you've pointed out correctly that it has to do with the way we approach texts. We do not start reading something knowing nothing about the topic. So we always approach texts with our own previous experience, our beliefs and knowledge of the world. And what prediction does is that it activates um, the schema, which means previous experience, knowledge of the world, and our own beliefs. So those experiences are uh, activated. And when the schema is activated, it is easier for students to approach the text. So the students start reading a text about a topic um, that they already know something about. But if the ideas from the text are new, we add them to our personal experience. And in other words, we are learning. So what we know about the world is as important as what we are going to find out from the text. So adding new ideas modifies this schema. Therefore, we are learning. And it is easier for students to interpret the text if you prepare them for that interpretation. And apart from these benefits, it also increases students' motivation to read the text. So yes, it creates interest in what we do. More ideas on how you can use prediction in your classroom. You can use stories. Uh, stories lend themselves to a variety of activities to practice prediction. You can show students the first paragraph of the story, ask to predict what happens next, discuss the ideas, display the next paragraph, check these predictions and repeat the whole cycle. You can use visuals, titles and pictures to encourage prediction. You can use questions. You can ask students to write questions that they think might be answered in the text. They read the text and check which of their questions were answered. 
you can use keywords from the text. Take keywords from the text and ask students to predict the content of the text based on um, these keywords. And when you take keywords and ask them to predict, it shows them that um, they don't need to read sometimes the whole text to understand it. They can focus on content words or keywords um, and get the general idea. All my students don't like predictions. So that's the variety that you can bring into your classrooms using stories, visuals, asking them to write questions or um, taking keywords from the text, making it more engaging. So what kind of processing was this one with predictions? Was it top down or bottom up? Top, exactly, correct. That was top down processing, right. Now, moving on to the next set of skills, I have chosen this aspect, the aspect of text organization. I'm going to show you the article, the BBC article, and I'll, I'll scroll down and I'd like you to identify the main parts or the main components and blocks of a news article and their functions. So have a look at it here. I'll be scrolling down. You can just make notes. The main components. So try to think about how a news article is organized. What are the main components that you can see here? Scroll up again to the beginning. So which components have you identified here? Title, subtitle, paragraphs, pictures with description, author, editor. That's it. Well done. Text, pictures, headlines, date of publication. Well done for noticing that. Introductory paragraphs. Yes, we have some links as well. Videos too, yes, if they are relevant. Description of pictures and paragraphs, advertisements, some sentences. Great. Yes, yeah, so let us have a look at it now in more detail. Thank you. So we always have a title which explains the main topic and idea of the story. We also have what is called, and you've mentioned it, the lead or the intro to the article. So it introduces the story and creates this a sense of excitement and it interests the reader to continue uh, reading the article. So this is called the lead. We also have some pictures, as you've mentioned. Pictures and uh, picture captions, they are worth paying attention to while reading a newspaper article uh, because they add more information to the story and to the pictures. There are also other components, some background details, opinions, comments, history. You've noticed even more like advertisements, um, information about the author, uh, the date of publication. Uh, and this is basically what constitutes a news, um, news article. So what is the purpose of analyzing the, the text structure in this way? What's the point of knowing the text organization? Easy to find necessary information, genre awareness, features, with navigation, absolutely. 
when to look for the main idea and where to look for it. Where to search, easy to understand. Great. Ability to write your own article. Yes, that's interesting. So you can use the information and maybe produce something um, that you would like to write about. Easy to speculate and to search. Yes, great. So the first point is that if students know the principle of different text organization, it will be easier for them to locate and interpret complex information and understand the meaning of the text. So otherwise, um, sentences and paragraphs may look like puzzles for them that needs to be assembled, but they are difficult to hang together. So it doesn't make any sense to them. Um, so this is how it may look like. It also exposes them, as some of you wrote, uh, to the overall framework of different types of texts. So here is, for example, the story structure that starts with intro and uh, finishes with resolution. So it will allow them to identify where and what information can be found in a specific part of the text. Next, students can read texts quickly. So what other ideas we have? You can supply texts and ask students to identify the patterns of organization. And we can have different patterns, like something that comes from details into more general, from general into details, from inside to outside. So they can identify these patterns. You can also, another idea is to cut each paragraph of a text uh, and ask students to put paragraphs in the correct order. So this is a very kinesthetic way of working with texts. You can also omit one paragraph in a text and ask students to analyze different options um, to fill in the gap in the article. And they decide which one fits the whole text and why. You can also ask students to analyze um, a text and create a diagram of the main components. Like this is just one of the examples. So what are the relationships between ideas in a text of a description? So how they understand it. Uh, and that kind of processing leads us to what type? So what kind of processing was that? Or maybe both, maybe that was this interaction. Down, bottom up, both. Yeah, you can think about how you looked through the article. You're right, um, it's both. Sometimes you were focusing, you might have been focusing on sentences. Sometimes you were focusing on titles. So you were getting the general idea. So we can see that you were using both your background knowledge of news articles, and you might read carefully at some points to decide on the purpose of each component. So this is the example of that uh, interaction. Yes, you got it right. Next, looking at the next skill that our students can benefit from is connected with words. What is the most common problem with words that our students face while reading something in the foreign language? Unknown words, unfamiliar words and meaning, exactly. So this is about dealing with unknown words and phrases and understanding them as well. I'm going to show you a couple of sentences um, that include the nonsense word talk, which doesn't exist in English. Your task now will be to deduce the meaning of the nonsense word by using the surrounding context. Uh, so you need to write what information you get from each sentence that I will be adding. Let me give you an example. So she poured the water 
into a talk. So I can infer that talk is something where we can pour water or any liquid maybe. Then lifting the talk, she drank. What other information can you infer from this sentence? That is something small. It might be a cup or a mug. It's not heavy. Yes, because she lifted it. it can be a glass, kettle. Hello from Kharkiv. Hello, it's fine. It's okay. It can be a bottle. All right. We can pour in and out of something. Yes, because she drank from the talk. And it's not heavy. Unfortunately, as she was sitting down again, the talk slipped from her hand. It is something light, something that can be broken. Smooth, small, oh, a spoon, <laughs> glass, and it's, it's fragile and slippery. All right. Only the handle remained in one piece. Remember, it's a nonsense word. So it's got a handle. That's what we can understand and deduce here. It's a coffee cup. So it's made of glass, very thin, fragile, slippery, something that we can drink from. Um, so you have great, great guesses. So what does, thank you very much. So what does this activity show us? It demonstrates that we need to raise students' awareness of the fact that they don't need every word to understand the text. So they don't always need to use the dictionary to help them. And they're not always allowed to, for example, during um, examinations. So if they can use the context to roughly and approximately understand the meaning of the words and identify the parts of speech, depending on where it is in the sentence. But it doesn't mean that their inference is the meaning of the word. So you need to warn them that it's just about probability. It's an approximate meaning. It's not about certainty. If they need a precise meaning, it can be found in a dictionary. So also they, they use their schema. They use their prior knowledge and background knowledge of the world to try and um, understand the meaning of the word they don't know. What kind of schema did we activate in this task? What were you thinking about? Touch, yes. Some images. General ideas that you had in mind about how you drink something. Yeah, agree. And such activities, they challenge students, uh, our students, and they become very enjoyable because it also involves their imagination. Now, some more ideas about how you can encourage students to work with words. So you can provide students with a gapped text with some gaps and you can leave out difficult or unknown words that you believe will be unknown to them. Um, when they complete the task on the general understanding, show them the whole text and elicit from them if they needed these words to get the main idea of the text. In this way, you will need to prove them that they can understand the text without knowing every word. So they don't need to understand every word. Number two, you can highlight unknown or difficult words from the text. And then for each highlighted word, you can provide a definition, different options. So they will need to use the context to choose the correct definition. And three, of course, you need to train them to use dictionaries. Um, it's just that they need to know 
what uh, option, what, what options they have, what options are available to them. So expose them to different features of dictionaries, teach them how to find different information about the word, where to look for uh, a part of speech, uh, for um, pronunciation, uh, and any information about the word and encourage them to use dictionaries regularly. But also remind them that they have this option of deducing the meaning of words from context. So sometimes ask students to replace the unknown words with the synonyms I offer them. That can also work. So you can expand their vocabulary and you can teach different synonyms or collocations. Yes. So, so far, we've looked at the examples of activities that you can use to practice both bottom up and top down processing, uh, choosing different skills that they involve. Um, and we need to always bear in mind that we need and our students need practice in both types of processing and everything will depend on their level, on their skills and the types of text that you choose which is something that we'll be talking about now. So how do we go about planning a reading lesson? So the first step, there will be several, is to decide on the type of a lesson. Remember in the beginning, I asked you what uh, you use the text for. Uh, some of you said for grammar and vocab, some of you for teaching reading skills. Now, the first step that you need to take is to decide on the type of a lesson that you will have using a particular text. In a language lesson, your primary focus will be teaching structures or vocabulary or teaching grammar. On the other hand, if you want uh, to plan a reading lesson, you need to think of the skills your students will be learning. And any new language, any new vocabulary will be a secondary or subsidiary aim of the lesson. So your primary focus will be training them uh, to use particular skills. And the text will be the source of meaning that they need to discover, not the source of grammar and vocabulary. For example, the text, uh, the, the article about uh, Queen Elizabeth can be used in different ways. Uh, it can be used to teach a vocabulary on the topic of, of the royal family, or if you use it in the way we did, it would be teaching and practicing prediction. So either language or reading skills, you need to choose that uh, in advance. The second step, choose a text. Um, first of all, we need to consider the topic that will be enjoyable for our students uh, to read about um, and to work on. For that, you will need uh, to find out more about what stu your students like and what they dislike. Also make sure that it corresponds to their level, not too hard and not too easy, because we also want to challenge them and we need to push them further. You can choose authentic texts texts that are not adapted, that are not aimed uh, for uh, to be included in students' books, uh, especially the ones that your students might read for real life purposes outside the classroom or after the course. For example, academic papers or a lot of newspapers or blogs on social media. And it will also bring variety into your classes. Um, alternatively, of course, you can choose a text from your course book. Uh, for example, I've chosen this article uh, about the Queen uh, for the group that is interested in the life of the royal family. So they were fans of the royal family. So I considered both the level and the interest in advance. And I knew that this topic, topic would be interesting for them. And I knew that they would have lots of ideas for making predictions and their guesses. Step three you need to decide on the learning opportunities from the text that you present. You need to read the text and you need to uh, choose the skills that your learners can develop using the text. For example, if the text contains a lot of visuals, you might choose to practice prediction and reading for the general understanding. Apart from that, you can think about the tasks 
that will provide students with appropriate practice. Uh, and you need to think about how will you organize the lesson um, and what kind of text you will be uh, using uh, with those tasks. One question that you might ask yourself is what task is a motivational reading task, a task that will interest our learners. First of all, your students need to know why they are reading. So the reasons might be different. To complete the task, to prepare to write an article on this topic, to find specific information, to guess the meaning of an unknown word, or to practice a specific skill that you mentioned before. Uh, the topic should be in some way interesting uh, for your group of learners. Um, and it can also contain a mystery or a problem that is solved in the text. So right from the beginning of the lesson, they will be engaged and they will want to find out more and work more with the text. Uh, you can create an interest uh, in the text and arouse curiosity by asking questions like, have you ever done this and that? Or what do you think about? So first you elicit um, their background knowledge, you, re you activate that schema, and naturally they will want to find out something that the text contains. So it engages them right from, from the beginning of the lesson. Engaging, motivating also equals engaging. So here is how I sometimes present a text to my students. What do you think can be a task for such a crumbled text? What can you ask your students to do? Read the words that they can see. Snowballs, make sentences with words, add ideas, make predictions. Describe a picture, add ideas. Yes, it is like, like a game to guess the idea. So I ask them to predict the story using only the words that they could see without touching the, this snowball. So that was very interesting for my, for my teenagers, especially. You can also collect uh, some books or articles in English that students can take, read and discuss in your lessons with each other, with you. Uh, and basically, it can be your own classroom library, which I found to be very engaging and very motivating for them. So we, we said that step three was deciding on what learning opportunities you can take from the text. Step four, the level of difficulty. Always um, give your learners a chance to study the text. First of all, generally having the overall understanding of the text, getting the overall message and idea, activate their schema, their background knowledge, and only then move to the detailed study of the text. So do that step by step from a more general to uh, a more detailed study. So here are two very common examples of tasks on general understanding. Look at the title. What do you think this means? Read and check your ideas. Uh, read through the paragraphs very quickly and match uh, the titles with the paragraphs. So this is a must for you uh, to start with uh, in the beginning of uh, your work on the text. Step five, think about the interaction in the lesson. So you can decide on how the students will be interacting with each other. There are three different types of modes of interaction and each contributes to the lesson very well. The class mode, where there is a lot of guidance from you, from the teacher, can allow you to control the class uh, right away because you're always interacting with your students. The, what might be the possible drawback of always having the class mode in reading, in reading lesson?
students might feel bored. It's a teacher led way of having a lesson. Yeah, too teacher centered, exactly. There is little time for student student interaction and uh, too much of you talking in the lesson. Group mode, on the other hand, promote a lot of discussions and it can be highly motivational because students can pull their ideas and work through the text together. Yes, yeah, some students are shy and afraid to express their ideas so it can help them uh, to discuss those ideas in the group mode in the beginning. The individual mode, where students work on the text individually and work out its meaning on their own, which is one of the most, it is the most important mode, because we read, you will usually read on our own. And the best approach would be to always combine all the modes and allow both for individual reading time, followed by group discussions with a teacher-led feedback, and the whole class discussion. So that kind of interaction will bring variety uh, into your lesson. And uh, one of the most crucial points is that rushing through the lesson to practice any reading skill is clear and reasonable to you because you are a teacher, you know what you're doing, but your students are sometimes not actually aware of their achievements in the lesson. Um, they don't even realize what they've learned. So what we can do is we can encourage self-reflection and to raise their awareness of the strategies and skills that they're gaining. So I'd like to suggest the approach that is called cognitive academic language learning approach. And ha let's have a look at how it is implemented. Let's imagine that um, the aim of my lesson is to provide students with the skills of deducing the meaning of unknown words from context. So I want them to practice understanding, deducing the words they don't know from context. First, you do the presentation stage. You present them with the strategy. You can show the students how to do it by taking an unknown word from the text and saying how you deduce the meaning. So basically you model the activity like I did in the beginning of um, our activity on the word talk. So you basically, you demonstrate how to do it. You describe the strategy or you can explain uh, why students need it. Then you move on and you allow students to practice the strategy. That will be the practice stage in different modes. Uh, finally, a very important uh, stage is an evaluation stage where students evaluate how they used the strategy. Uh, so students reflect on what they did in the lesson and how they can apply it outside the classroom, because sometimes they think that they can make, make predictions only when you ask them. And this is something that they cannot do or they don't need to do outside the classroom. So one question that you can ask them in which situations are you going to apply the strategy? In which situations are you going to need to deduce the meaning of unknown words from context? So that's basically the structure that you can follow. And in this way, your students will feel that they're developing, that they're improving, and that they actually have learned something in the lesson, something that is relevant for them. And they're improving their reading skills. And most importantly, this is something that they can, uh, that can be transferred outside the classroom and applied in their day-to-day -day activities. So if you follow this structure, the students will feel the development and you will also uh, feel that they leave the classroom with something valuable to take outside uh, into the real world. So reading, as a habit, um, of course, at the end of the day, the question is, how do we inspire students and motivate students, motivate our learners to read? The answer that I personally find to be very encouraging and helpful is that the best teachers of reading are also reading teachers in the sense that they are teachers who read. So let us be role models for our students 
Uh, let us show them that we love reading. Uh, let us show them what we read. Uh, so let us share our passion and interest in reading. And I'm sure that our students will turn reading into the habit of a lifetime. And we can share this passion with them. So basically, um, that's it. Uh, with, so this is, was the presentation stage from me. If you have any questions, please let me know in the chat box. We still have a couple of more minutes. Are there any benefits of reading a text aloud? There are not really many benefits because um, usually when students read a text aloud, it's mainly a pronunciation practice uh, because it's very difficult for the brain to focus both on comprehending the meaning of the text, developing the reading skill, and also thinking about how they pronounce the words, um, how they sound, if they, everyone can hear them well. So if you want to do a reading practice, or a practice on reading skills, it's better to do it um, uh, silently. Thank you very much. Um, how can we teach students to read between the lines? Oh, that's the question of making inferences. One activity that you can do is that you can apply students, but bear in mind their level. Uh, it might work for intermediate level, especially for upper and advanced students. You can um, take um, a sentence or a paragraph from the text that is not explicit the one that contains some implicit information. You can ask students to read the paragraph and you can provide them with different options of what the author actually meant. So they analyze the text, uh, they analyze different options and they try to think about the actual meaning, uh, the actual message. After that, you discuss together what they think and you can guide them, you can teach them how they can infer uh, the meaning, make inference. They can do it using their own background knowledge. Uh, they can do it using the context, knowing uh, the writer, knowing the purpose of the text. And in this way, it, it can facilitate a very fruitful and productive group discussion. So let me go back. Is there any difference between scheme and schematic? No, uh, this is one is uh, singular form and schemata is a plural form of the word. What about translation of a text? Well, you can translate a text, but then it will be a different focus. You might focus on the correct way of translating uh, collocations, for example, uh, or chunks of language or idioms, uh, but that might not be um, necessarily a focus on, um, on the reading skill. This is something that's connected with language. Uh, do you have any courses how to teach reading IELTS? Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, our manager, uh, Julia, will uh, talk to you a bit later, so she might help me with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your kind words. Developing critical thinking skill as well. Yes, you can develop critical thinking skills uh, through, again, doing that reflection, evaluation, teaching them how they can analyze their own reading skills. That will be something that's connected with critical thinking. So we need to leave students to read uh, to themselves. Um, if you mean for them to read silently, yes, it's better to do for them to read um, on their own first and then uh, so that they can contribute to group uh, discussions. Thank you for the good brush up of Salta. Yes, a little bit of Delta as well. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all very much for your interest, uh, for your attention, for, for the wonderful and very creative ideas. Uh, it was my pleasure to present today. Um, 
also, uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, you will receive the presentation. So here is the list of useful books and articles that are full of ideas for classroom application, uh, a little bit of methodology, and um, some websites that you might find useful, where you might find some activities. This book, um, Developing Reading Skills, contains a lot of classroom activities. So I believe that you will find something for to take into your lesson, for your reading skills lesson. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.